campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Today's speaker has been a generous and encouraging colleague of mine from the Canadian Society of Medievalists. Dr. Donna Trembinski is an Associate Professor of History at St. Francis Xavier University, coming to us live today from Antigonish in Nova Scotia. Her research is focused on the intersection of medicine and religion in the long 13th century, and she's also published on the idea of trauma as a category of historical analysis that can complexify and nuance history. Today's talk, entitled Illness and Authority, Disability in the Life and Lives of Francis of Assisi, is based on Dr. Treminsky's uh, book published by the University of Toronto Press, which came out in 2020. And it was just awarded the Hagiography Society's book prize for, the, for last year, 2022. Uh, just to give you a bit of, of an idea about the logistics for today's talk, it will finish and allow time for questions around 1245, the, Central Standard Time, and that allows that if we've got students in the room, that they can feel free to pack up their things and leave to get to their one o'clock classes. So I will provide a little bit of an opening for that. Um, and if you're joining us today virtually online, you're just as welcome. And please feel free to contribute any comments or questions that you have in the Q&A box located at the center of the Zoom screen. And when we provide that time at the end of the talk, we will be sure to read out your questions and have a response from Dr. Trembinski. Uh, so thank you so much. And please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Trembinski today to speak on the life and lives of St. Francis of Assisi. Thank you, Donna. Thank you so much, Meredith. I'm just gonna uh, share my screen, hopefully. We'll see if this works. Um... Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Yes, we've got it. Yeah. Oh, th thanks, Meredith. I know. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm always delighted to um, kind of get to geek out about Francis of Assisi, who has uh, been a constant companion for the last 10 years of my life. Meredith can attest that every talk I've done at the Canadian Society of Medievalists, even in the one on, on trauma, have involved Francis in some way, so he's been a constant companion. Um, and I am delighted to have this opportunity to talk. I, I have, I think, uh, shortened this presentation enough, but, you know, um, if you have questions, please feel free uh, to jump in and interrupt. Um, I'm happy to chat uh, as well. I always feel like online I'm a bit um, uh, away from my audiences. Uh, so, um, yeah, feel free just to jump in if you have questions. I'm happy to answer. Okay. Uh, just beginning with a, 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 an acknowledgement, uh, land acknowledgement from where I'm from. Uh, so my presentation today for me is taking place in the Mi'kmaq, uh, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, I'm an uninvited guest in this territory, which is still governed by the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1725. Um, and we like to say, as we do across Canada, that we are treaty people and have to remember that we're still governed by these treaties. Um, turning to Francis, this is um, a word cloud that I created uh, from the Wikipedia article about St. Francis of Assisi. And um, just want you to take a look and see what's there. Uh, what I'm interested in, though, is what's not there. So we see lots of what we would expect, Catholic, Francis, Pope, Franciscan, Order, Saint, right in the center there. Um, I'll just point out that there is, I don't know if, I hope you can see my cursor, but there's stigmata here right underneath, sort of to the left of Francis and kind of below Christian and life uh, right there. But this is the only, and if you see something that's there that I don't see, but this, as far as I can tell, this is the only space 
um, the only thing in this whole world word cloud that we can see that alludes to the idea that Francis had illnesses, infirmities, disabilities. I use these terms, uh, disability is a little different, but I use illness and infirmity because they're the closest uh, English cognates to what we have in the Latin. But there's nothing in this text here or this word cloud that demonstrates uh, that there's any kind of suffering involved in Francis's life at all. And that for me is really interesting and that, it, that, that even in the modern period, as we're sort of supposed to be critically looking at lives of St. Francis and Francis himself, that there's no discussion uh, of, of um, his lived experience of suffering. And that sort of is the starting point for the book I wrote. And I'm gonna sort of start there. We're still telling the same kind of stories that were told about Francis, uh, the stories that developed 60 years after his death. And so the book is kind of an intervention, uh, trying to change that narrative a little bit. So in order to take apart the traditional narrative, I kind of have to tell you a little bit about the traditional narrative. I don't know how, how many of you know um, about Francis. If you were in a room, I would have asked you to raise your hands and tell me a little bit about what you know. Uh, but uh, since we're not in the kind of space that allows for that, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Francis. Um, the, the traditional narrative really was developed um, uh, by three individuals, uh, St. Bonaventure, and then two artists, uh, Cimavu and Giotto, who were responsible for creating um, a cycle of Francis's life that uh, was in the Basilica dedica dedicated to him in Assisi. And these two, yeah, th th this story kind of developed um, about two generations after Francis uh, had died. This is a really late um, uh, image of Francis from a medievalist perspective at 16th century. Um, but I like it because I think it, it demonstrates very clearly the differences we see between Francis and Bonaventure. So Francis is there um, uh, dressed very plainly. Of course, both are focused on God because they were both dedicated to God. But Bonaventure was very much part of the church hierarchy in a way Francis really wasn't. Uh, and you can see that, of course, in the, the Bishop's Mitre and Crozier that uh, Bonaventure is holding. So although earlier lives of Francis were written, thank goodness for that, otherwise I wouldn't have a book, the usual narrative of Francis's life was crafted more than two generations after his death. Uh, St. Bonaventure's life, really 1221 to 1274 about. So he was about five when Francis died and he didn't know Francis personally. Bonaventure was the seventh minister general or leader of the Franciscan order, the first order that Francis founded, he founded two more, but this is the, the primary order of brothers that he founded. Um, after he entered the Franciscan order, Bonaventure, uh, before he became minister general, he was a schoolman, which is a, a kind of lifestyle we're pretty sure Francis wasn't super keen on. Um, he studied and taught at the University of Paris, and I might get in trouble here, but Paris is kind of the, the intellectual center of Europe in this period, so he studied with important people like Thomas Aquinas. Um, when Bonaventure became Minister General, he one of the things he was tasked to do or, or took upon himself to do uh, was to write a new life of Francis. And this occurred because there were a lot of different lives of Francis in circulation at the time, many of which had different messages. Um, uh, so, so one of the, his jobs was, to, or one of the things he tried to do was to kind of clean up Francis's legacy. Um, and in doing so, he was trying to kind of steer a middle road between elements of the order that wanted to live as Francis, is ha Francis had. So living a life of what we today might call apostolic poverty, having no goods to one's own name, the order having no goods, could hold no property, um, and uh, begging for daily food and shelter. And those elements in the order who didn't believe that was a very um, it wasn't a good way to run a large order. It didn't allow for forward planning or really for, for being able to concentrate on 
preaching, which was one of the core Franciscan goals, because one was always concerned about where one's next meal was coming from and where one was going to live. So Bonaventure was trying to mediate between those two very different elements in the Franciscan order and bring everybody together. And you can see that in how he talks about Francis of Assisi. Um, it's, it's quite clear uh, that Bonaventure changed or modified aspects of Francis's life in order to try and create a middle ground. And scholars agree on this. That's not anything that's out of the ordinary or not agreed upon. Um, Bonaventure sort of wrote his life of Francis. Uh, he wrote a, a major life and a, and a minor life. Uh, and these were finished in the 1260s, presented at a general chapter meeting of the order in 1266. And after they were accepted by the order, he ordered, and it wasn't out of a sense of, it wasn't like, it wasn't malicious, but he ordered that all previous lives of Francis to be destroyed uh, because he hoped that this new life would be the new narrative around which the entire Franciscan order, both um, sides of it, could come together and coalesce. Um, Bonaventure's life uh, was used as a template for the images of Francis's life cycle that was painted at the Basilica dedicated to Francis at Assisi, and I'm going to talk about some of the important images uh, we see here. Uh, some like there's lots of th this cycle is um, I don't know how many actually images there are but there's several images in this I'm only going to talk about a few and I'm only going to talk about a few um, stories for Francis's life because I don't have time to spend as much time as I would like. So Francis, Francis lived. Uh, he was born approximately in 1181 or 1182, and he died in 1226. He was canonized very quickly after his death in 1228, uh, and the Pope at the time was Gregory IX, who had been a very close friend and advisor to Francis and the Order. Um, so he's canonized in 1228. There's lots of work done on Francis' canonization. Um, it was done for uh, um, political reasons as well as religious reasons, um, and the fact that Gregory was close to Francis uh, probably helped that canonization along. No canonization records exist from Francis's canonization, which is unfortunate. The early lives tell us that Francis was a son of a relatively wealthy cloth merchant, and in his youth, he lived a free-spirited free life and dreamed of becoming a knight while he worked for his father. After a long illness, he came to the realization that he was not living life as he should and began to contemplate how he could best devote his life to God. Not yet ready to live, leave the world, he contemplated how he might best devote his life uh, and had a few experiences, two of which are depicted here, uh, that helped him kind of come to the realization he needed to withdraw from um, the life he was living. The episode on the left is when Francis meets a poor knight and gives him the clothes that he's wearing himself. So he's learning how to be charitable. Um, and on uh, one that isn't depicted here, he also, there's an early story of how he encountered a leper. Uh, and appalled at the revulsion he felt while seeing the leper, he uh, um, he uh, uh, sort of runs over and kisses him. Bonaventure tells that story and suggests that the leper was sent by God uh, to test Francis, and Francis passed the test. After the, this vision and after the encounter with the knife, uh, with the knight, Francis began to live a more solitary, contemplative life. He heard a voice telling him to. Uh, Sorry, one day while he was praying, and this is a second image here, uh, before the crucifix in another church in Assisi, San Damiano, uh, he um, heard a voice telling him to go and repair God's house. Francis took this literally, which is one of the things I love about Francis, and he went out and actually started trying to repair a broken down church, something he wasn't very constitutionally um, uh, made for. There's, there's commentary from people who see him about how he's not meant to be doing this kind of hard labor. Um, uh, so Francis took that that idea literally, that he was supposed to go out and repair churches. But Bonaventure suggests uh, a much more common reading that, that a lot of us have now, uh, that Francis was actually being told to repair the church as a whole. Um, between 1209, when he sort of came, he sort of most fully embraced this new way of living, and 1219, Francis traveled around Italy um, once uh, beginning a trip to Morocco that he had to actually stop. Um, but he, he basically traveled and preached, attracting people to his very simple way of life. He did manage to travel to Egypt 
in 1219 with a, a party of the Fifth Crusade, where he, according to legend, preached Christianity to the Sultan. And that's the story that's being told here uh, on the left. His efforts, unsurprisingly, were not met with success. Uh, but apparently, according to the stories, the Sultan very much respected Francis. The panel on the right shows another really iconic moment in Francis's life, his preaching to the birds. This is a common theme in early lives of Francis, including Bonaventure's, and that's his love of nature and God's creatures. The Franciscan order grew rapidly. Um, uh, um, uh, modern estimates suggest that the order numbered over 2,000 by 1219 and probably was over 5,000 by about 1222. In 1221, as the order was expanding internationally, Francis shocked his followers by stepping down from his position uh, as leader of the order. And this is something that many lives record. Bonaventure's, argue, Bonaventure, sorry, Bonaventure's life argues that the saint's resignation was due to his extreme humility. He wished to obey rather than command. We're going to come back to that resignation. This is perhaps the most um, uh, well-known uh, part of Francis's life, um, and that's his reception of the stigmata. In his later life, Francis experienced many illnesses and infirmities. It's difficult to know precisely when, as in Bonaventure at least, he uh, Bonaventure arranged his life of the saint thematically rather than chronologically. Uh, and Giotto's narrative cycle, or maybe it's Chima Vu's, there's a lot of debate, um, the narrative cycle in the Basilica, anyway, does not include any images in which the saint appears anything other than perfectly healthy. Bonaventure concentrates his discussion of Francis's illnesses in, in one single chapter dedicated to the austerity of the saint's life. This gives the impression that it was the saint's severe asceticism that caused his infirmities, which is how often Francis's infirmities have been read uh, over time by scholars, too. He turns treatments of unspecified illnesses into ascetic feats. Any allowances that the saint did make um, uh, for his illnesses was the cause of great penance, according to Bonaventure. Um, uh, discussions of illnesses in Bonaventure are not linked in any way to outcomes that might have occurred as a result of this illness. So, for instance, um, Bonaventure works really hard not to actually acknowledge that Francis had any kind of visual impairment, which we know he did. Um, the closest mention we have uh, to uh, visual impairment is, quote, an illness of the head and eyes, which is mentioned in Bonaventure. Bonaventure also doesn't link Francis's illness in any way to this most famous event in Francis's life, his, his reception of the stigmata. The story of the stigmata is that in 1224, roughly two years before his death, Francis was in contemplation at Mount Laverna um, when a seraph appeared and marked him with the wounds of Christ. Francis is often called the first stigmatic, but this is actually not true. Uh, he's certainly one of the earliest to have physical stigmata, but probably not the first. And this, the, the, there's been lots of really great work done on the stigmata recently. Um, and you can see the tradition of metaphorical stigmata from the time of St. Paul. Um, and uh, certainly the idea of stigmata is being talked about long before Francis uh, experiences them. For Bonaventure, uh, Francis had received, of course, the literal wounds of Christ on his body in Laverna, in, on Laverna, sorry, in 1224. For Bonaventure, and it's very clear in his life, it's the stigmata that were the cause of the saints' uh, health deteriorating rapidly after 1224. And then his death comes in 1226, right? So Bonaventure very clearly limits the amount of illness that Francis experiences. And when he does talk about illness, it's, it's, it, usually is placed chronologically after uh, Francis receives the stigmata and is linked to the reception of the stigmata. So that's the traditional narrative. I'm going to spend the rest of the time I have now uh, talking about why I want to challenge that traditional narrative and how I challenge it. First, I read all the lives and tried to read them through the lens of disability studies. I could spend a lot of time talking about disability studies, although there's lots of people more qualified than I am. Uh, but I will say that at its heart, disability studies in the discipline of history aims to recenter experiences of illnesses and infirmities um, that have been marginalized in discussions of the past. And that's what I try to do with Francis. 
The sociocultural model of disability studies to which I normally ascribe generally recognizes that there's a distinction between the infirmity and illness as experienced by the individual, which is one thing that's separate, and how that illness and infirmity is treated by society. A disability occurs when social reaction to an illness or, firm, or infirmity presents barriers for agency in an infirm or ill person. So the disability isn't in the person. The disability is in the society that uh, presents barriers to someone with that illness from participating fully in society. Taking this into account, I want to suggest here, and I suggest in the book, that if we look at the earliest and most reliable testimonies of St. Francis, and there's like, I have like a whole slide and 20 minutes of a talk uh, that talks about the sources I use, which I am not gonna do here, but if you're interested, I can talk about it. So I take what you're gonna have to trust are the most reliable sources of, um, of Francis's life. Uh, and I want to say that in those sources, his illnesses and infirmities were much more central to his experiences, especially, but not only, in the last six or seven years of his life. I further argue that there were serious ramifications to his illness, the illnesses that he experienced, both within the order and outside it. Um, and so I look at the sources, and then I further contextualize Francis's illness within the larger medical and political discussions of such um, illnesses and infirmities in 13th century Umbria, where Francis spent most of his time. So that's my idea. I try to read the lives through the lens of disability uh, theory, disability study. This is a slide I've used for 10 years. I'm sure Meredith has seen it like 15 times. Um, but it's still a useful slide, so I still use it. And this is sort of when I finished reading all of the lives, uh, I kind of came up with a new um, sort of timeline of Francis's illness. And it, it, to me, it was very clear that Francis was ill from the time of his conversion. People talk about his delicate constitution in, in like events that were happening in 1207. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to suggest that in 1202, uh, he he seems to have been imprisoned uh, as a result of going to war with Assisi against Perugia. He became a prisoner of war. This is this. It's mentioned in one life, and there's some circumstantial evidence that supports it. Uh, during his time in prison, it looks like he got quite sick. And the reason we think that is because he was sent home before the war between Assisi and Perugia ended. Uh, and that would only have happened if he was quite sick. So he returns from that um, uh, war uh, quite sick, having to use a cane to walk, uh, but he recovers. And it's in the course of this recovery that he has his conversion moment or moments. He has a delicate constitution. There's a few stories between 1202 and 1214 that suggest he's in relatively good health, but it's always precarious. In 1214, he travel, tries to travel to Morocco, gets to Spain, uh, and then that trip has to be canceled because he gets quite ill for quite a long time. In 1217-1218, we have a, a winter where he has constant fevers. This episode is usually dated much later, but I argue in the book that it should be in this period much earlier than it's generally dated for internal reasons. I can talk about that too. In 1220, he returns from Egypt with, and this is a direct quote from one of the texts, much pain in his eye. This will be a constant concern for the rest of his life, and he begins to experience visual impairment. He's also at times in 1220 not able to walk as well as he used to, although that seems to come and go depending on the moment. In 1224, he receives uh, the wounds of the stigmata, constant bleeding from his sides. He's increasingly unable to see and to walk. And in 1226, he's quite visually impaired. Uh, he's unable to walk. He's, he has wounds all over his body. He experiences illness of the spleen, stomach, and liver. He vomits blood. This is directly from all the lives. He has constant headaches. And then he finally pass, passes away in October of um, uh, uh, 1226. So obviously, because I have like 15 minutes left, I don't have much time to explore every aspect as much as I would like to with you guys uh, of how Francis's lives may have, uh, sorry, Francis's illness may have in, impacted his life and ministry. So I'm going to concentrate on two different aspects. One's an event, his so-called resignation that happened around 1220 or 1221. And, and the other one is his visual impairment that I'm going to spend a bit of time on. So Francis's retirement. Again, I have whole articles on Francis's retirement. 
Uh, so I'm going to do my best to summarize it fairly quickly. At a general meeting called by Francis when he returned to Egypt, and Francis, when he returned from Egypt, is quite unhappy at the way the vicars who are looking after the order have changed his religion. They've made it so that the order can hold property for the first time, can have houses that uh, in which Franciscans will sleep and be cared for. He is not happy about that. And so the implication in some of the lives is that this chapter was called at Francis's behest because he was so angry about that. At any rate, the meeting is called when he returns from Egypt. And at that meeting, seemingly to the surprise of everyone, Francis actually steps up and announces his intention to stop leading the order. And no one's quite certain why. In his place, he chose Peter of Catenio as a vicar to lead the order, announcing to his brethren that from this point forward, he's dead to them, which is quite dramatic, actually. Uh, and indeed, uh, it looks like Although Francis chafed, and he did chafe at his inability to lead the order after 1220, he did allow his vicars, first Peter of Catanio and then later Elias of Cortona, to do the heavy lifting of administering his ever-growing order. So he does seem to have stepped back from administering the order after 1220 or 1221. Scholars have tended to believe one of two things about Francis's resignation. One, either that Francis had recognized that the order had become so large and that the bureaucracy needed to sustain it meant that Franciscans could no longer live the life that Francis wanted them to live, one of apostolic poverty. And so in defeat, Francis retreated from the decision-making process of his order. Like it already wasn't what he wanted, so he stepped back. Or they argue that Francis took the opportunity um, uh, that his resignation afforded him to live the life he preached, a life of extreme humility, extreme obedience, and extreme poverty. Uh, Francis not only preached renunciation of power, scholars argue, he lived it. Yet early testimonies of Francis's life suggest there may be more to this resignation. The Assisi compilation, which is one of the most reliable texts about Francis, mentions Francis' resignation three different times. And in the narrative, so it's clearly important because it, it comes at three different times. And um, in one of the narratives, it implies that Francis would have had the will to keep leading his order, even in the face of it moving in a direction he wasn't comfortable with had he not been ill. The Legend of the Three Companions has a story about how Francis saw a vision of a black hen with dove's feet and so many chicks that the hens were unable to keep them all, uh, that the hen was unable to keep them all and protect them all under her wings. Francis himself in this story interprets his own vision uh, to mean that he would have so many followers that he would not be able to protect them all with his own strength. So there's already some indication in early lives that Francis resigned potentially because of illness. However, Francis wasn't always happy he resigned. And um, I don't have time really to delve into this, but one of the things I argue is that um, Francis was actually encouraged to resign by other leaders in his order and by um, uh, the cardinal protector of the order, the Bishop of Ostia, who later became Gregory the Ninth. And I argue that based on circumstantial evidence, I'll admit, but I do think there's something there. I think he was encouraged to resign because he was ill. And I can talk about why I think that if you want. Um, it's very clear, though, that there's tension between Francis and his vicars about the direction of the order after the resignation, especially in terms of how they understand apostolic poverty, how Franciscans are supposed to live. And there's evidence that suggests Francis was not, was not always satisfied with his decision to allow others to lead the order. Uh, Francis was conflicted clearly about his removal. Perhaps his resignation from administration, I argue, was not born wholly out of his desire for humility or from his recognition uh, that he neither enjoyed nor excelled at administration, although I think those things were true, but because of his increasingly disabled body forced uh, this withdrawal upon him. Thus, a brother close to Francis could relate in the Assisi compilation that the saint had once woken up uh, during a bout of illness saying, who are those people who took my religion and my brothers uh, from my hands? If I go to the general chapter, I will show them what I will. So this, this, it's a bit problematic because the Assisi compilation was written late enough that it might be infected by other people who thought the order was going in the wrong direction. Um, but the, the fact that this story is there uh, perhaps suggests Francis was um, um, not very happy about having his order wrested away from him. 
Recentering Francis's illness in his life thus suggests a potential new interpretation for a much debated event in Francis's life. So I've treated that really uh, superficially, but I can talk about it a bit more at length if you would like in the questions. I also want to show you a few things just uh, around visual impairment. This is, as you can see here, called the blessing for uh, Brother Leo. We don't, we have three different autographs of Francis, so we don't have a lot of his writing. Um, uh, this one is is a really important one. It's, a, as you can see, a blessing that was given to one of his very close companions, Brother Leo. Leo kept it with him after the saint's death for another 25 or 30 years before granting it over to the Sisters of St. Clair. Um, and the red at the top, which is tiny, is um, um, Francis's, uh, sorry, is, is Leo's writing. So you can see he's well-trained and his writing small. The, the, the sort of brown writing is uh, Francis's. And I just, I show you it just to demonstrate that there is some evidence of visual impairment here. It used to be argued that this that that Francis uh, wasn't very skilled at writing, and so this is a result of his not being very skilled at at at, at writing. But if you look at, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I hope you can. But if you look here at L E O N E Leone Frate Leone, um, just the unevenness of that line and the different sized letters. That's more typically something you would see um, with someone who is visually impaired rather than someone who is not necessarily great at writing. Show you this one too. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is a letter that was written to Brother Leo. It's typically dated later uh, than the blessing, not much later, like six months later. And again, I just show you the right the writing, the size of the letters is even bigger here. If you look at this this Benedictione here, this just to give you one here, one example, the space between the letters suggests that every letter is written really deliberately. We don't have the creeping up on the lines that we had in the blessing, but here too, this appears to be not just evidence of someone who's not very skilled at writing, but evidence of, of, of uh, visual impairment. Francis' visual impairment, clearly outlined in the autographs you've just seen, uh, would have been regarded as really problematic. And again, I don't have time to get into why, but um, it was linked with sinfulness and an inability to see God in Umbria. Uh, there's a lot of evidence of that. So it would have been seen as problematic. Um, it is perhaps for this reason that Elias of Cortona, then Minister General of the Order, uh, and the uh, Bishop of Ostia, the Cardinal Protection of the Order, so later Gregory the Ninth, insisted that Francis seek treatment even after Francis, even against Francis's own stated wishes. And in fact, the word used most often in the in the lives is that he was ordered to receive treatment by these people. Um, uh, Francis's visual impairment was problematic for uh, his advisors, the people leading his order, but it was also problematic for Bonaventure. Um, for Bonaventure, Francis's blindness had to be managed. He had to choose blindness. So this is not my work. This is actually work done by Scott Wells, who's done an excellent job um, outlining this. Francis, Francis's blindness in Bonaventure is talked about as having been brought about it, first of all, it was only potential. It never actually happened. And it was brought about by his weeping for God. Uh, so Francis Bonaventure doesn't really acknowledge Francis's visual impairment at all. And so this is what I outline in the book, the scrubbing of the saints' lives, of his illnesses and, and impairments, and the impacts that those illnesses and impairments had, and the care that he required to treat them. So I'm wrapping up here. I got five minutes, and I think I can do it. This is a process of what other people have called hagiographification. That is taking uh, any idiosyncrasies or oddness in, in the saints' lives and kind of smoothing it out. And this is what we see happening in Bonaventure. Um, they normalize these idios idiosyncrasies and audit oddities. They make the life of the saint conform more closely to what medieval people expected to see in the life of a founder saint. This normalization certainly papered over much of Francis's experience of illness and the tensions caused within Francis's life. So for instance, just to give you two examples, Bonaventure disappears doctors. Like they just disappear. He tells the story, but the doctor is gone. And then he also, and this is when I'm going to spend a little, the last few minutes on, um, uh, he also demonstrates that Francis, um, uh, uh, he also just doesn't talk about how Francis reached for things that would comfort him in times of physical distress. In particular, and I, 
in particular, he leaves out discussions of Francis's love of music. It's very clear from the earlier lives that Francis loved listening to music, and especially when he was ill, drew great comfort from singing himself uh, and from hearing other people play music. Bonaventure doesn't acknowledge that. The other thing Bonaventure scrubs out is uh, Francis's desire for comfort foods. There's at least two occasions where Francis wants to eat something, a special fish or marzipan, and um, Bonaventure does not tell that story at all. There's no comfort food in Bonaventure's life of Francis. It's not perhaps an enormous surprise that he scrubs it, since in all cases we have a Francis who is not merely accepting of his suffering, but actively seeking physical human comforts uh, to, um, uh, to alleviate it. So last slide. So, so what? Who cares, right? I would argue, actually, the so what is really important. Here's what I, I hope the book did, and I hope you got, got a sense of it, although this is quick. I would say that looking at the uh, that Francis looking at Francis through disability studies matters for several reasons. First, it provides a much more nuanced view of Francis of Assisi. I'm pretty sure that my own work has overemphasized the disability in Francis's life, but it's an important corrective to the traditional narrative that ignores it. Uh, it also shows the importance of how adding disability as a category of historical analysis can change how we understand what historical events we really thought we understood. There's 3,000 books written about Francis, right? And I, you know, I, I do think that my, my book adds something new. Um, it also helps us reframe and highlight disability where it's been overlooked and marginalized as it is so often historically and today. And finally, it helps us free center Francis the man rather than the saint as a model for how one might experience disability in a couple of ways. In the social model of disability, we understand disability not to be what a person experienced in their body, as I've said before, but those barriers to full life they might encounter. We see this over and over again in the life of Francis. He's asked to resign because he's considered too ill to lead. He did so, but sought other ways to continue to influence the, the order, from letter writing to trying to live an exemplary Franciscan life. Potentially deprived of his bodily autonomy when ordered, and I mean ordered, to receive treatment for his visual impairment against his wishes, he either subverts those giving orders or uses the event to demonstrate the importance of obedience and submitting to the will of those in authority. I hope that Francis's model of finding agency in the face of barriers encountered is a model that's no longer quite as needed as it once was, but I'm not entirely sure about that. And lastly, I think it's important to recenter not just Francis's experience of disability, but how he responded in times of pain. It's quite clear in the earliest and most reliable lives of Francis that the saints sought out comfort from favorite foods, marzipan, a favorite fish, or from music, his own or the music of others. Bonaventure in particular did his best to hide that Francis who needed creature comforts. I think it's important to recover these small but important stories though. Too often, even in our modern world, and certainly in the medieval, pain and suffering is understood to be about good results. No gain, no pain, right? Well, this is, at least in part, due, in, uh, due to how Christian theologians in late antiquity and the medieval period constructed pain and its meaning. Francis is a counterexample and an influential one. If Francis needed comfort when he was sick, why shouldn't everyone be able to reach for similar comforts? And thank you. I am mindful of the time. If there are some of you in the room that need to get to one o'clock classes, feel free to, uh, you know, that you can leave if you need to. And, and of course, you can always help yourself to the refreshments. But we do have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes here for questions or comments. If there was something that uh, Dr. Treminsky brought up that you, you're thinking about still, or you have a question, this is a real opportunity to, uh, to have that chance to ask it. If there was something else you were thinking about. Any comments in the Q&A box as well. For those of you who are joining virtually, you can feel free to add it there. And uh, I've got uh, my amazing assistant, Crystal, here who can read out some of the comments if those come up. Uh, and if not, I, I think one of the things I'd like to start the discussion out with is that question of blindness and where it is okay for the people telling the stories about Francis to start talking about this. And I wonder, Donna, if you could unpack a little bit or, or explain to us about maybe why blindness as a particular disability 
you know, maybe why the nuances with spiritual blindness or, or why this might have been a problem for the Franciscan order and for Bonaventure in particular in telling this story and yeah. uh, where he's going to tell people about Francis struggling with his eyesight. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, it's it's not unnuanced, right? There's there's a lot going on, but it seems to me uh, that the and there's a lot of debate about how how blindness or how visual impairment was um, perceived in different parts of medieval Europe. Um, but overall, it looks like in Umbria, and that's what I looked at because that's where the context was. It was perceived to be um, problematic, like it was perceived. It, it was linked to. Um, it was linked to the inability to see God uh, in various populations, as I said. Uh, and so I think for that reason, it was really, and it's very clear, I didn't get to talk about this, but it's very clear that that um, the leaders of the order are very intent about, they don't really care, and this kind of answers one of the questions in the chat too, uh, Elias Cortona and, bon and um, uh, Ugolino, Gregory the Ninth, don't really care uh, about his other infirmities, but they care very much about his visual impairment. Uh, and so they they send him to various specialists all over Northern Italy to try and cure it. And so to me, that signals that it's the visual impairment that's a problem. And I think it's because it's both linked to sin and it's used, it's not used in Umbria, uh, but it is used in Tuscany as also a punishment for various crimes. And so I think there's this concern um, and it seems to me in the lives, it seems particularly focused on the visual impairment. They don't care as much about the physical suffering. I don't know if that answers the question, Meredith. But. It does. And I think that that's why that's so interesting amongst all of the other things that St. Francis was struggling with. But I, I don't want to hog things here. Do we have a, a question in the in the chat? Um, yeah, so Donna, Crystal here. Um, I think you can see the chat there. And we did have a number of questions come in. Um, so you can see those? Yep, I can. Do you just want me to answer them? Yeah, sure. So um, we can probably just start at the top. We um, yeah, there's actually quite a few. So if you want to just work through them. Um, sure. As you, know, you can see, I think, uh, Jim at the top, maybe. Yep, that's that's what I see. So the question is, if, if Francis was ill and infirm, might have, one might, and this is absolutely true, have expected him to make pilgrimages in hopes of a cure. And is there evidence of pilgrimage? You know what? This is such a great question. There is not. You know what there is? Evidence of seeing doctors. Isn't that fascinating? So especially in the time when there's a lot of debate, there's like the uh, Fourth Lateran Council telling people you have to take care of your soul before you go see physical doctors. Um, in that moment, that, you know, very soon after that, Francis is, is obviously his spiritual soul is in pretty good shape, uh, but he's going to see doctors. He is not praying for alleviation from his infirmities. He's seeing doctors. So I, I think... Um, I think two things. I think one, they weren't very concerned about the state of his soul. Uh, and also I think that they they saw a real need to cure the visual impairment in whatever way they could. So shall I just, I'm just going to oh, go down. If you're, if you're going to answer the next question, could you perhaps read the question first? Just sure. Just so we can see it on the screen in the room. Sure, absolutely. Um, so this is from Sasha. What made you want to pursue this area of research? You know, <laughs> this is not that great a story. Uh, there was an open, uh, a colleague of mine and I were organizing a local conference right here in Anganish, and someone dropped out at the last minute, like a week before. And um, my friend said to me, uh, and colleague said, can you do anything? And I was like, well, I've been rereading really, really Life Francis. Maybe I could do something about that. And honest to goodness, by the time I'd spent the week looking, I was like, there's something here. And so for the next 10 years of my life, I worked on this book. So it was really just happenstance that there was a, a break in a conference that got me going. I'd read Lives of Francis and worked on Francis for my dissertation uh, um, amongst lots of other saints' lives too. It wasn't only Francis. Um, but this allowed me to take a much deeper dive, which is fun. Um, this is from, oh, I'm going to mispronounce your name. I'm sorry. Is it Zana or Zana? I'm so sorry. Thank you for your presentation. As someone who has considered herself a scholar in disability studies, I appreciate the, uh, the lens that you have used in your scholarship. Disability is reality and is also used as a metaphor. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we see disability working in different ways uh, here. And one of the things I hope people take from Francis's life now is that one of the things that for me is really important is that like he did, he wanted comfort in times of pain. 
And I think that's a reasonable, you know, I think that's an important observation. Uh, Chris writes, is sharing his cloak a copy of what St. Martin's did much earlier? Uh, yes, I, I think absolutely that's part of the, you know, his that whole conversion narrative, uh, uh, the early part of his life is very much, um, even in the very first life that was written by Thomas of Solano, is very much following conversion narratives, typical conversion narratives. So uh, yes, I think probably Martin is a model uh, for that particular uh, story. So, so even the earliest lives, they're following models. They're, they're following the expected trajectory of a conversion. And then I just have one more and then I'll stop. Uh, did he get the hand wounds, foot wounds and side wounds? Uh, yes, this is from a person that is registered as CK. Yes, yes, he was supposed to have had all three. And in particular, the sources talk about how his um, he, he hid them. He didn't want people to see them unless they were very close to him. Um, and the side wound in particular, uh, the sources tell us, uh, constantly bled. There's a lot of debate about what the stigmata are and, and what they mean. Uh, but certainly the sources suggest that he bled consistently from his side uh, after his um, reception of the stigmata. I think I've exhausted questions. <laughs> okay, well, I have another one here from the room, if that's okay, Donna. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to ask? It's Mike, so they should be able to hear you. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I, I'm not clear if you can maybe uh, just help me say a little bit more. When Francis is the resigned from or, or stood back from the secular life and he made his mind up to, to pursue what he did, um, you're saying that the illnesses and the uh, disease states that he's experienced helped shape his, his uh, spiritual journey. But yet he made that commitment very early on, before he was really ill with anything serious. Yeah, yeah, so. okay. So I, I actually don't, or, I mean, it has been argued that Francis' illness shaped his spiritual journey, and I don't want to deny that. That's, but my my interest is more that... Um, the illness, not many people have looked at the impacts of his illness on his, uh, so I'm, let me start again. I'm not as interested in his spiritual journey. I'm really interested in his ability to exert um, uh, authority over his order and authority within the Catholic church. So that's really what I'm looking at. And so that's why I spend a lot of time on the resignation, uh, because I don't think it's necessarily only about humility or only about obedience. I think that there was a, a role that his illnesses played in, encour in encouraging or moving uh, other leadership members to ask him to resign. So that, if I can follow up with that, because that really leads into my next thought. Sure. If that's the case. Um, then what we have really historically is seeing Francis that is very weak, meek, and really subjected to the ailments of humanity in that sense, with um, lifestyle and existence in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, he's so successful in, in um, well, it's great, it's very weird, but developing the order and people following as they have, that it's lasted through, through time, through history, and, and, and the magnitude of what he's developed. Uh, I mean, I think he must. Have, okay, so I, I didn't, you cut in and out. So um, please tell me if I'm not answering the question that you asked. But I, I do think he must have been incredibly charismatic, you know, and his way of life clearly spoke to people. There's been lots of good work done on this around uh, how his, his call for poverty at a moment when uh, capitalism was beginning to emerge is, is, I think, was really attractive in various ways. And I do think he must have been even ill, incredibly charismatic. Um, so that you're right, the fact that he was able to do this, um, even as, especially towards the end, and I would argue for his entire converted life, uh, dealing with illnesses is is uh, nothing short of, of, of incredible. I, I was more interested, like I said, in, and I do think that he had an incredible spiritual presence. It's pretty clear that people have traced that. But I all, and, and, and we don't know so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking on the ground here, so I apologize. But the other thing is, is that we tend to, of course, see history through our own lens. And I don't know that, I don't know that, I don't know how people would have read the illnesses. Certainly at the end, they're reading um, the wounds of stigmata. 
or you know they're potentially seeing seeing him wounded but seeing those as as gifts from christ i don't know i don't know i don't know yet how medieval people were reading disability i know that the visual impairment was going to be a problem i don't know about the physical suffering because it was so common so i don't know if that's a helpful answer or not or if i even got it what you wanted to know but it is it's certainly perspective it's um uh, i think it helps sort of put that into into the perspective of of his life and you know the the context in which the people are ordering him to go see doctors and so forth that they're ordering him that he's not really in full control why would they just cast him aside and, and disregard his order entirely but that did not happen so, yeah i think so you you, you asked that uh, you replied to that uh, i think yeah, I, and I do, I do think that there's definitely a, a a section of the order that, and I don't know how big that section is, but a good part of the order that still sees Francis, even though he's not the political leader, he is absolutely a spiritual leader, and they can't, you know, they can't separate that. Lastly, do we know the cause of his death? Was it was it uh, due to leprosy or? Yeah, there's a lot of debate about that, and I try very hard in the book not to actually diagnose because it ultimately doesn't matter. Uh, I do, I do think there's been a lot of discussion that it's probably Hansen's disease, leprosy, and and I I do think that makes some sense. Yeah, okay, uh, but I oh I said that publicly. I do not say that in the book, and I I I will never publish that because it for my analysis it doesn't matter. That's okay, we're having specul speculative discussion at this point. <laughs> So that's okay. We're allowed that. The talk is over. We're just having some conversation. <laughs> so don't worry about that. Okay. Well, thank, uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Treminsky again for such a wonderful chat. Of course, you've got the opportunity to help yourself to some refreshments. And um, we will, we have recorded the talk and we'll be in touch about uh, possibly making that available on the college's YouTube channel uh, in another week or so. Uh, and certainly keep in mind that we've got another lunch hour lecture coming up in early February. We have Dr. Zachary Yuswa from St. Thomas More's uh, University in Saskatoon. So he will be speaking to us on early uh, modern uh, Canada and the role of the Jesuits there and uh, colonizing narrative. So uh, please join us for that talk. And otherwise, please join me in thanking her. Thank you.